power and authority of Jesus as he cast about 2,000 demons out of the man and sent them into the 2,000 swine that were nearby. Over in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, it says this, At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So let's sing it out on All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
something about that name. You know, in our message last week from the book of Mark, we learned the owners of the swine were very upset when their pigs ran down into the sea and died. Evidently, they can't swim. The townspeople wanted Jesus to leave town because they love swine more than the Savior. You know, and so at this time, Robin is going to come and sing for us, I'd rather have Jesus. And you know what? May that be our prayer this morning.
Amen. I'd rather have Jesus. Amen. Good to see you, Julius and Lorraine. Glad you guys have been able to make it today. Thank you guys for all coming. Um, what a privilege it is to come to the house of God and to be able to learn and to be able to see uh, those things He'd have for us. Today, the title of our message is Jonathan and His Armor Bearer. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter number 14. 1 Samuel chapter number 14 is where we will be today. And I'm going to open in a word of prayer before we begin the preaching of His Word. Lord, we love You. Once again, we thank You for this privilege we have to worship You. We pray that You would just go before us now, Lord. Open our hearts and minds to receive those things that You have for us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter number 14, familiar portion of Scripture here for us um, as we look at this uh, place, but I want to make sure that I uh, bring to our attention some special things that I see here um, that God has uh, brought to my attention and study in this particular area. And before we get into 1 Samuel 14, I want to do a little bit of a rewind to the chapter before that, 1 Samuel chapter number 13, just to give us a little bit of context as to where we're going uh, with the lesson today. And so 1 Samuel chapter number 13, and I'm going to read to us here uh, several scriptures from 1 Samuel 13, verse number 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And so here, Saul is entering into his second year of reign as king over Israel. He has 3,000 uh, valiant men, if you will, warriors that he has uh, chosen. He's got a couple thousand with him. His son Jonathan has a thousand with him over in uh, Gibeah. Verse number three, and Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten a garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And so here there's a, a battle that takes place with the Philistines. I don't see anywhere in Scripture right here that says that Saul was a part of this battle right here that uh, Jonathan uh, uh, was a part of and overcame these Philistines here, but Saul sure did take credit for it, didn't he? The trumpet was blown. Um, the people gathered themselves there unto Saul. They felt like they had a, a great victory in this battle. Verse number 5 of 1 Samuel 13, "...and the Philistines gathered themselves to fight with Israel." And so Jonathan and his efforts here really stirred up a hornet's nest, didn't he? The uh, Philistines are now going to gather themselves to fight with Israel. The Bible says here in verse 5, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash eastward from Beth Haven. And so Michmash is that place where um, Saul was with his couple of thousand guys. And now you have 2,000 men of Saul with him. And you have 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and a multitude of people that is greater than what you would see on the seashore um, as we go down here to Long Beach. Amen? It's quite a contrast, isn't it? And they're there in this place and they're coming up with one intent and that is to take out Israel for, for going against them. 
Verse number six. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Remember, Gad, that's the place of the Philistines, isn't it? And so these people here um, begin to be- get afraid because they see the tremendous force that's getting ready to come against them. Now Saul started out with a couple thousand guys with him, didn't he? But the Bible says right here, boy, they all start running from the hills, don't they? They start getting in caves and in the pits and and hiding in the tall weeds and everything else. They're fearing for their lives. There's great turmoil happening here in Michmash at this point. To finish up verse number 7, the Bible says, As for Saul... He was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. So there's a great fear that came upon these people as they see the force that's there. And Saul, uh, being that new leader, just entered his second year. Uh, Boy, now you remember when Saul first came on the scene, he had a great victory, didn't he? He saved the the children of Israel there and there was a great victory and the people lifted him up. And you remember, the people were the one that called for a king. They were tired of following God alone. And they said, we want to have a king like other nations have. And that's how Saul came into this stead of kingship here. And he is in his second year, but know this, God wanted to lead His people alone, didn't He? But he went ahead and gave the people their desire. And he said, you want a king? I'll give you one. And he gave him Saul. And Saul is here. And he's afraid for his life. And all the people are trembling as they follow him. Verse number 8 of 1 Samuel 13. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. There's a little bit of chaos going on here. The people are unsure. They're waiting, they're waiting a week, and Saul's telling them, you know what? Samuel's coming. Samuel's coming. As soon as Samuel gets here, uh, we're going to be able to do something. And boy, Samuel doesn't come in their timing, does he? Samuel doesn't show up when he thinks, and all the people began to scatter. Verse number 9, And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. This is a bad place for Saul to be. He's starting to make some decisions on his own here, isn't he? He's starting to lead his people as he is in a place of great fear and trembling. And he's beside himself. In my own mind as I read this, the the people are closing all around him and he he sees this and he knows he's outnumbered and he says, man, I need to do something. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and do Samuel's job and I'm going to go ahead and make some offerings unto the Lord and hopefully God will help us in this. Verse number 10, And it came to pass that as soon as he made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him. And so Saul, in his perspective, man, he is he's excited to see Samuel come on the scene. But you know what? Samuel is not so excited to see that smoke billowing up out there as he's coming to meet Saul, is he? He sees something going awry out here. Saul is is, uh, leading these people outside of the authority that God has given him. He's failing to do those things that God has asked him to do. And he he begins to offer those burnt offerings. And now, here comes Samuel. And man, Saul is going out to salute him and and say, man, Samuel, it's good to see you. We're glad you're here. We're we're in a great place of uh, turmoil. Verse number 11, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered a burnt offering. Samuel comes and challenges the new king here with his behavior. And what he is doing. Samuel is the man of God here, isn't he? This is not Saul's place to be offering the offerings on the altar to the Lord. Saul is the king. And Samuel is asking him, what are you doing, Saul? What is happening here? Why are you doing such a thing? 
Verse number 13, listen to this here. Verse number 13, And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, and he, as he command, which He commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be a captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul started to get a little sideways in his thinking here, didn't he? You know, when I read this portion of Scripture, I wonder what happened with Saul's train of thought. Why would he do such a thing and go outside of what God had commanded him to do? Well, you know why he did it. He was afraid, wasn't he? His emotions within him were stirred up. He was put in a place where he felt like his back was against the wall. And once again, just like we discussed in Sunday school, Saul had to come up with a hasty plan right away because he was feeling the pressure of his circumstances. He thought, man, I better do something. I can't wait on God's man to come. I can't wait on God to, to speak with me in the way that he's commanded. And so he goes ahead and he does something that he has not commanded. And boy, Samuel is very quick to point that out as he comes on the scene and sees what Saul is doing. The kingdom at this moment has been decided by God to be taken from him. He's just started his second year of reign. We remember how long Saul reigned over the children of Israel, some 40 years. But here, entering his second year, God has already made the decision because of his rebellion against God that he is going to take the kingdom and give it to another. Someone will lead in the way that God has asked him to lead. Verse number 15, And Samuel arose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him about 600. Now remember what he's facing. 30,000 chariots. 6,000 soldiers on horseback. And more people than the sand on the seashore on foot, ready to, to destroy Israel. And Saul takes a quick count as to the men that are left with him, and he counts 600 men. Now, I'm not sure what you would think if you were in that position of having 600 men versus an innumerable amount of enemy. But Saul here is allowing the pressures of his circumstances to cause him to lead with his flesh. And he chooses not to wait on the Lord. He chooses not to wait on God's man. Verse number 16, And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And so they had taken over this place that Saul was previously at with his couple of thousand men that were there. The Bible says that Saul's men were scattered from him and everybody was running for the hills. They were afraid as to what was happening and Saul has a mere 600 men left with him. Verse 17, And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. You know, in these times here of war, there were actually specific groups of men and companies that would go just to take all of the goods that were left behind by those that had been slain. They were full of uh, uh, horses and, and carts that they can load all these things up in. And these, uh, the job of these particular uh, soldiers was to simply gather up all the valuables from those that had been slain in battle. And the Bible says the spoilers begin uh, to make their move and to get into position. Let me find myself here. Verse number 11, And Samuel said, or I'm sorry, 
Verse number 17, And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leadeth to Ophrah, and the other unto Shuol. And another company turned uh, the way to uh, Beth Haran. And another company turned to the way of the border that looked to the valley of Zebulim in, uh, toward the wilderness. And so the spoilers begin to separate up and make their way. Um, and uh, I know that Saul, as he sees all this activity, great fear is coming upon him. He knows that the battle is getting ready to start and he knows that, boy, his men are going to perish. How can he have a chance against them? After all, you know what? Saul is leading with his emotions, isn't he? I don't see him considering God a whole lot as he's watching these things go on here. And I'll say this, for us as Christians today, if we're not careful, we will focus too much on our circumstances and not enough on God. And if we do that, our circumstances be can become overwhelming to us. You know, as human beings, we're fragile. And we don't have uh, the mind of God. God says that His ways are not our ways, are they? And even though the smartest people we can have walking upon the face of the earth, we think we can have a good plan and all these things. But you know, as, as human beings, we're fragile and we, we tend to think about ourselves, don't we? And Saul here is afraid. He, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He sees all this movement going on. He's got God's man upset with him. He's already told him that the kingdom is going to be rent from you, Saul. You've chose to disobey God. And now all these soldiers begin to move around. And I can only imagine the mind and the heart of Saul as he's considering what he should do next. That's part of the problem. He is considering what he should do next. Verse number 19, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. You think about this just in itself. The Philistines had had some forethought as the children of Israel had rose up against them previously. And uh, they've cut off their ability to make instruments of war, haven't they? They've not allowed them to uh, retain those people that have the skill set to be able to do those things, nor the, the sharpening stones and those different things. The Philistines held on to all of those. Verse number 20, But all of, all of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his axe and his mattock. And so the Philistines had made things in a way to where the people were completely dependent upon them. If they wanted to, to sharpen up some tools, even to, to do harvesting and gardening, they had to go down to the Philistines to ask permission if it was okay. Now, I don't want to go too far into a rampage on this or not, but you know what? The government of the United States of America right now um, has been currently on that rampage to say, you know what? We want to take all those instruments of war from the people that live within the United States of America, namely our guns. We don't want people to have them. And you wonder, why would they say such a thing? Well, they don't want the people to be able to defend themselves against tyranny, against the authority of government. And here, the Philistines have aligned themselves in a similar matter where the children of Israel really have found themselves in a place to where they are lacking those instruments of war, if you will. Verse number 21, Yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. Nobody had a way to defend themselves with any swords or spears. The Bible says that not any of the people that were with Saul or Jonathan had a sword or a spear to defend their nation. None of them. Zero. Well, we know how that would work out against an enemy that is full of swords and spears. And they outnumber you greatly. You can only humanly think of the outcome of that if it was allowed to play out. But listen here. Verse 22, the last part of it. But with Saul and with Jonathan, his son, was there found. And so the king, he's got his sword. His son Jonathan's got his sword. But not anybody else that's here 
has anything to defend themselves. Verse 23, And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. They're preparing for battle here. They're preparing to take out the children of Israel. And Saul is frantically trying to figure out what his next move will be. That's the backstory of where we're going today in our message. Great turmoil. Great fear amongst God's people. And they're not sure as to what's going to happen. They have a great enemy that is standing before them. 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse number 1. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. You know, some people, if they would have heard what he's doing, would try and stop him from what he's doing. You hear what he's doing? He tells his armor bearer, come on, we're going to go over onto the other side, the enemy's side, to where the Philistines are. Just you and me, we're going to go over there. Come on, let's go ahead and make our way. And he didn't tell anybody he was going. His father didn't know where he was, and he went over. And you know, there are times in our lives where we may have that calling from God to be able to oppose some ungodly behavior or an ungodly uh, group of people and their actions. And you know what? If you choose to stand up against that, you better be ready for some opposition. There's probably going to be some people around you that tell you you're crazy. And you should not have even think about what you're doing. And give you all the dangers and all the reasons why you should not have do it. But I'll ask you this, would you rather obey God or man? If God has impressed upon your heart to do something for Him, would you rather obey God or the reasoning of mankind? Here, Jonathan tells his armor bearer, come on, we're going to go up on the other side and this is going to be a private, covert mission. Nobody is going to know, just you and I are going to go. Verse number 2 of 1 Samuel 14, And Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibba under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. And the people that were with him were about 600 men. And so Saul still had those 600 men retained, uh, the, the soldiers that were there with him, and he's underneath a pomegranate tree, uh, probably completely perplexed and anxious and fearful and not knowing what's going to happen next. Verse number 3, And Ahiah, the son of Ahiatub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod, and the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And so Saul is there with those people. He's, he's got uh, the man of God there uh, with him as well. And Jonathan has already made his way uh, over towards that Philistine camp. Verse number 4, And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over unto the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sina. Now think about this. Have you ever, have you ever been someplace where there's been canyons? I think of Zion up in Utah. I don't know if you've ever been there. Great canyons and cliff sides. And, you know, you think about the Grand Canyon. Um, there's even lots of places here in California where we can go where the canyons are so steep. Even the San Gabriel Mountains here, we can see sheer rocks jetting up. I think about Yosemite and um, the Dome of the Rock and all these great places where there's just rocks on both sides. And humanly speaking, it would be treacherous to try and climb those things. And you know, the Philistines' garrison was set in a very strategic position so that there would be only an entry that uh, could be sought after that they can guard. Anybody ever been to Yosemite? And I remember going there and being across that valley from the Dome of the Rock and seeing people hanging up on ropes on the face of that rock and thinking, man, those people are out of their minds. What are they doing up there? And they're doing it for fun. But you know what? That's not the preferred way to go, is it? As we hiked around up there in Yosemite, we took the trails that were frequented by many others because it was an easier route. But here we see Jonathan and his armor bearer as they get ready to make passage over into the garrison of the Philistines. Boy, they're taking the tough way over, aren't they? 
They're going up uh, uh, through these canyons and whatnot. Verse number five, the forefront of the one was situated northward against Michmash and the other southward over against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. Do you hear the confidence and the trust beaming from Jonathan as he says that? He is differentiating here between God's people and those ungodly that are on the other side. He said, let us go over into the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. Saul's son, Jonathan, has a little different perspective than Saul does, doesn't he? He knows that God can do anything. He knows that if God is in this battle and He wants for the children of Israel to be victorious over the Philistines, that it doesn't matter the number of people that He has to use. After all, Jonathan is there with his armorer bearer. There's two of them. They've chose to take the difficult way over to get to the camp of the Philistines, their their garrison, the place where they were all residing, the place where they would all gather before they were going out into battle. It was their area. And yet Jonathan says, you know what? God just might work for us here. It's two men versus 30,000 chariots. 6,000 horsemen and, and a people that is innumerable, greater than the sand of the sea. But yet the boldness and the faith and the trust that Jonathan has, he says, if God wants to use me here, I'm willing to go. Will you come with me? And so Jonathan and his armor bearer begin to embark on this. Verse number seven, and his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. His armor bearer, the one that is there to help Jonathan in battle, it's only these two men. They know the great force that opposes them. And yet his armor bearer says, Jonathan, I'm with you. Now we talked a little bit in Sunday school about peer pressure. And the negative peer pressure that came upon Aaron as he made the decision to uh, uh, create that, that calf out of gold. As Moses was there speaking with God on Mount Sinai. And Jonathan here, he is in a completely different place, isn't he? He says, you know what? God may just use the two of us right here. We don't care what else has happened. If God wants to deliver these men, He's going to use us. Verse number nine, or I'm sorry, verse number eight. Then said Jonathan, Behold, we will pass over unto these men and we will discover ourselves unto them. So Jonathan begins to give the plan here of what him and his armor bearer are going to do as they go to face this innumerable force. You know, one of the things that I had the privilege of doing when I was in the U.S. Army as a combat engineer is they always sent us to the very front of the fighting line. You got to go and get very close to the enemy. In fact, they'd have us count equipment, count people, count weapons, try and figure out everything that they had on their side the best that we could. Boy, you were almost getting breathed upon as you were there in the front. And there was some fear that resulted from that. Boy, you were like, you were so close to them. And Jonathan and his armor bearer here have the courage just to go right forward into the enemy's camp. Jonathan says, okay, we're going to go and we're going to discover ourselves to them. We're going we're to make it known to them that we're here. Now, that in itself doesn't sound like a great plan, humanly speaking, does it? You think that if they were wanting to go over and take care of them, they'd want to sneak around and hide behind the bushes and the rocks and the different things and, and maybe begin to take out people uh, covertly with, with them not understanding how it was happening or anything like that. But Jonathan says, no, the plan is we're going to go. We're going to discover ourselves unto them. Verse number nine, if they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you. 
Then we will stand still in our place and will not go unto them. So Jonathan says here, hey, we're going to show ourselves to them. And if they say, hey, stay right there, hold on, we'll be right down. Jonathan says, boy, if they say that, we know God doesn't want us to go fight this battle. But then he goes on to say this. But if they say thus, verse number 10, come up unto us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. Think about this trust that must be there with Jonathan. As he faces this innumerable force, and he says, you know what? I don't care that it's just me and my armor bearer and all the rest of those cowards are all fearing and trembling back there with my dad Saul. God has told me to move forward and face the enemy. And if God wants us to be a part of overtaking them, he will use you and I to do just that. Verse number 11 And both of them discovered themselves under the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. And so they see them coming and they're they're mocking them. They see two men coming. They know in their own minds, humanly speaking, that two people showing up in the midst of all these that are gathered there with the Philistines are no match for them. They're probably thinking, boy, we're going to have some fun with these two. And we're not talking about the fun that we would desire to have on the weekends or something, are we? They're planning to kill these young men. Verse number 12, And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we'll show you a thing. (laughs) They face the enemy and the enemy says, Yeah, come on over here, young people. Israelites that have climbed out of the holes, come on up here. We got something to teach you. Typically, those words come from our enemy, and we want to turn the other way and hightail and run, don't we? Knowing that there's something bad that's probably going to happen. God, Jonathan, man, those words that were said there come up unto us. That's the key indicator for Jonathan to know that God is in it. And Jonathan at that time turns to his armor bearer. Man, this is the time. God's going to be with us. Let's go. And they begin to make their way. Verse number 13, once again, and Jonathan, or I'm sorry, let me finish verse number 12. I'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. This is two men right here. Facing a battle, humanly speaking, that should never be won by these two men. Humanly speaking. But Jonathan knows that he's on God's side, doesn't he? Verse number 13, And Jonathan climbed up upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. Remember, Jonathan's got a sword, doesn't he? And as soon as they got up there, boy, they started wailing away on the Philistines that said, come up here, we got something to show you. Verse number 14, and that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. So they had these 20 men kind of as the forward watch, as you will, right? And they go in and they start taking these guys out and they kill all 20 of them. Two against 20 is quite a battle, isn't it? Think about that. Not, let, not the, the, the battle of everybody, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and all this. 20 people is still would be tough to overcome, humanly speaking, by two men, wouldn't it? But not if God's in it. And not if it's God's will for this to happen. And they slay these 20 men here. Verse 15, And there was trembling in the host... In the field and among the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled. And the earth quaked, so it was very great trembling. The earth quaked. The Philistines recognized something out of the ordinary is happening. These two men have come up and they've slain our men that are on the forward watch. And now the ground begins to shake and the trembling now transitions into the camp of the Philistines. 
Those 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and the the others on foot that are uh, innumerable. I can imagine the excitement in Jonathan's heart as he's participating in this. Man, God is using us. God is working on our behalf. Look what's happening. But if we looked at the odds, humanly speaking, boy, we'd be quick to say, don't do it, wouldn't we? You're going to get yourself into problems if you do that. You know, I don't know if you guys heard here recently, there was a children's choir called Rushing Brook Children's Choir. They're from Greenville, South Carolina. They were there in Congress uh, here on May 26th, just about a week ago. And their whole choir showed up for a very specific reason. Otherwise, why would a children's choir show up to Congress, right? And they began to sing. You know what they began to sing? The Star Spangled Banner in Congress of the United States of America. And do you know what the Secret Service police there did to them? They stopped them from singing the Star Spangled Banner in Congress. Put hands on them, got them out of the facility for singing the Star Spangled Banner. Their reason? Well, they hadn't gained permission from the Speaker of the House yet to sing. So we're just going to put them out. Think about the position of America and where we have come to and the place where we're at where we can have our government participating in ruling our nation, but they've lost their perspective on things. And they quieted these young people from singing a patriotic song about the United States of America. You know, as I read that, I was really surprised to see how different our country was becoming from one another. I went on to read this. There was a man named Adnan Saeed. He was convicted of murder. He murdered his ex-girlfriend in a rage because she didn't want to be with him anymore. He served 20 years in prison. He was just recently released this last week because our country believes that murderers need to go free and they let him go. But yet they stopped this young children's choir from singing in Congress. But yet we're letting murderers run out on the street. Another man by the name of Michael Maman LeBanc. That's actually his his, uh, alias, Maman. He had been guilty and found guilty of murder just five years ago. And yet our government just recently released him under the authority of some new compassion law that they have for people that are serving life sentences in United States prisons. You know where he went after his release? He went right back to Donnensville, the place where he lived, where he murdered this young man so many years earlier. And yet our government said, no, we're letting murderers go. Boston, here just a week or so ago, released 21 first-degree murderers from prison under this same Compassion Act that they've uh, recently signed in. California has the same thing. In fact, you may have heard this. um, Some of the family of the Charles Manson family those that went out and murdered folks back uh, here some years ago and have been in prison for some time, there was one in the family that was released here in California under this very same law. We've lost our way, haven't we? And we think about the opposition that Jonathan and his armor bearer were facing with going against this ungodly group, the Philistines, and it was only two of them that were there that chose to go against thousands and thousands and thousands of enemy that opposed God and His ways, but they were willing to go, weren't they? I wonder if there's any willing here in the United States still to stand up for our country that God's given us and the liberties that He's given us. To be able to say, nah, you know what? Shutting down a kid's choir from singing a patriotic song probably shouldn't be happening. And letting people found guilty of murder shouldn't be happening in our country either, should it? 
But I'm afraid to say that there's many of us here in the United States of America, and I won't say us because I don't include myself in the group of people that wants to just go with the flow in this country right now. If God has called us to stand up against this and voice our concerns about what's happening, we ought to do it. We shouldn't just mumble under our breath about what's going on and go with the flow like everybody else is going with. Here, the Philistines, this ungodly nation, this uncircumcised nation, they're brought to a place where they're brought to their knees by two men that were willing to go in the face of adversity. They chose to go. And they chose to go because they trusted God. And they trusted Him and they had faith in Him. And they trusted Him with all of their being. Otherwise, why else would you have two men go face an innumerable force lest they knew God was on their side? And God was on their side and He worked on their behalf. And as we read through the remainder of this story, we don't have time to do it today, but as we read through this, we know there was a great battle that uh, uh, came to play here. And you know what? God used those two men. And you think, well, how would those two guys go and kill those innumerable uh, amount of forces that were out there? Well, God uh, caused these people to be in such fear. Boy, they started killing each other. That's what the Bible says. It's amazing, isn't it? The people began to fall on one another. The Philistines began to fall on one another. And all those Israelites that were so afraid and fled, remember some of them went to Gad and they went over there where the the, the garrison of the Philistines were. They saw all these things happening. And boy, they became excited about the things of God again and said, God is working. And they began to fight against the Philistines as well. And the children of Israel had a great victory in this place because of the faith and the trust of Jonathan and his armor bearer. And so I want to encourage us here today that even though we face great opposition, even in a great country, I believe our country is a great country. The United States of America is the best country that's here on this planet. It's a country founded on the principles of God. And they're trying to take the liberty that God's given to us away from us. Our very own people. They're not thinking straight. Are we willing to stand up and do our part? You know, we have the ability to do that. We get to vote, don't we? Shame on us if we sit home and we don't do that. As Christians, we need to stand up and we need to express our views and we need to vote for those things that we know are godly and we need to vote against those things that are ungodly. That's the way that we make our voices known. We get to participate in this process. You know, just as a lot of you know that there's typically not a lot of participation. 100% of the people in America don't vote when it comes to the things that go on in America. It's a small group of people that participate in that. I want to encourage us to do just that. Participate and voice our concerns. If we don't do it, who is going to do it? You know, you wonder how would Jonathan and his armor bearer have the trust and the faith to do such a thing? Well, it's only because God was working in them. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior today, you don't have any hope for tomorrow. Jonathan and his armor bearer, they had hope in God, didn't they? And they knew that nothing was impossible with God. And they chose to move forward and say, Lord, if you want to use me, I'll be willing to go, even if it's only me. And it was, it was only the two of them. And they went forward and they watched God work. Don't throw your hands up in the air today and say, man, our nation is gone. There's nothing that can be done. There's plenty that can be done. God's will can still be done in this country and he can elevate some godly people into places of leadership and allow those that are doing evil in our country to receive the consequences that are due them and elevate those that are law-abiding citizens. But you know what? It's only going to come as we trust in the Lord. The Bible says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are altogether become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Romans 3, 10 through 12. Man, that's very evident today. And I know that as I look at myself, I know I'm in that lot. I'm a low down, no good sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
It goes on to say, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to die for the sin of mankind, didn't He? So that we might be reconciled to Him. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. I'm so thankful for Jesus Christ coming and dying for us. And he knew that we were low down no good, didn't he? But yet he chose to come anyway. Romans 5.19 reminds us, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. I'm so thankful for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Romans 6.18 says this, Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. I'm so thankful I can say that today, that I chose to bend my knee to Jesus Christ so many years ago. There's a price to be paid for sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There's only one way. I'm thankful for our my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He sent His only begotten Son. We need to be willing to understand that we're a sinner in opposition to God and turn from that and be willing to receive the free gift of salvation, believing in His death, burial, and resurrection. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. If you've not trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd encourage you to come see me today. Call the church office if you're listening to this and you've not yet come to that place. For without Jesus Christ, you have no hope for tomorrow. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for the truth of your word. We thank you for these courageous men that you have showed us here in 1 Samuel 14. Being willing to face odds that most men would think would not be able to be overcome. But yet we know with you all things are possible. Even the salvation of mankind. Even the worst sinner can turn and bend their knee and receive your Son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. And we're thankful for that. We pray, Lord, that you would just be with each one of us here today as we go out. And if there's anybody here today that has not trusted your Son, Jesus Christ, as their personal Savior, we pray that you would just convict their hearts, that you would allow them to think about nothing else other than the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that they come to that place to ask for his forgiveness and trust Him as Savior. Bless as we go out today, Lord, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll see you guys all back here at 5 p.m. tonight. We'll be back studying the book of Acts.